today uh, to worship with us here at Midway. And I got a question for you. Do you ever feel, do you ever feel like life's kind of like a balance beam? And you look at life and you start this journey of faith and you see what lies ahead, but the farther you step, the farther you get along, the more and more narrow this journey of faith starts to look like. The more and more difficult it becomes to keep your balance. The whole point of this series is that even though we lose our balance, you know, a lot of times in life and it gets narrow and we feel like life's narrowing up on us and our balance is off and we're falling, we're slipping and we're stumbling, that God wants to make a way for us not only to know him but to walk in faith in such a way that, and here's the point of one, this series that we're in, we're in week five of our series called One, that we can not only walk in him and know him in such a way that gives us strength but we can do it together. That we can do it as a part of this thing that Jesus instituted called the church. He said, I will establish, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's this concept of one, that we are one body. And so far, we've looked at four key things. In Ephesians chapter 4, by the way, if you've got your Bibles, flip there with me. We'll be reading that in just a moment. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. But we, so far we have looked at one body, one spirit, one hope, and then last week looked at one Lord. Today's topic is one faith. One faith. And this whole concept of faith brings us together. And as you're finding Ephesians chapter 4, I'll read you a verse that the prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 7. He said this about faith in the Holman Christian Standard Version. He says, if you do not stand firm in your faith, then you will not stand at all. It's Isaiah 7 and verse 9. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. You've heard it said, but the biblical approach to that is if you don't stand firm in your faith, you're going to stumble and you're going to fall every which way that you turn. But aren't you glad we have a uniting faith that we can put our hope in today in our Lord Jesus Christ? And I challenge you right now to look around the building. Just look at the diversity and the variety of people that you see. You'll see different races, you'll see different backgrounds, you'll see people who like to eat one thing, some that don't like to eat that thing, you'll see some that like to eat more than others, you'll see a lot of differences represented in this building. There are a lot of different people in here and we represent a lot of different backgrounds, different cultures, different ideologies, but there's one reason that we're all in a room today. And it's not because we have a lot of stuff in common, it's because we have one common thread and his name's Jesus Christ. And that's why we're here. That's what Jesus instituted the church for. That's what this one concept is all about. The the faith that we have in Jesus Christ transcends all differences. It bridges all gaps so that we can follow after a God who's going to take us farther in this community and in our lives than we ever dreamed possible. That sounds great in all actuality, but the reality is that there are still times in life where faith is not such an easy thing to pursue. Amen? Amen. A lot of times it's a difficult struggle. The life of the balance beam of life gets unstable and you feel like you're going to fall and slip and stumble. And whether we like it or not, there are those people in the world as well that kind of breaks this bond of unity that God wants us to have. And you know what I mean by those people. I mean those people. Right? Those people that you see their car in the restaurant you're going to eat at and decide, you know what, I might want to go to McDonald's instead and pull out. Or you see them in a line in Walmart. Y'all act like you don't do this. Don't lie. Okay, just checking. Just checking. You see them on one aisle, and and they're on the bread aisle, and you need that bread. But you see them there, and you're like, oh, not today. Not today. So you go, I'm going to get milk first. And you head the other way, and then you make your loop back around. There are those people in the world, and here's what I want you to do. Hopefully, you're here today with somebody that's not one of those people. And so what I want you to do is look at that person that's not one of those people. Do it right now and just say thank you. Now, if you didn't get a hearty thank you, then you might just be one of those people. (laughs) But here's the reality. Here is the reality. We, to someone at some time or another, are always one of those people. That's news to some of you, but I'm sorry to break it to you. We're all people and we're all different, but we all serve one Lord that we talked about last week. His name is Jesus, and he bridges all those gaps so that today we can be one. And that's what this one faith is all about in Ephesians chapter 4. And so if you've got your Bibles and are ready for the word, say amen this morning. 
Verse number one, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. With all. And here's where four key qualities we're going to dissect briefly this morning before we dive into some key thoughts about faith. Four key qualities. With all lowliness, verse 2, with all lowliness, that's humility. With all gentleness, with long suffering, that's the dreaded P word, by the way, patience. Anybody else struggle with that? Can I hear amen? amen. Bearing with one another in love. That's where this unity comes from. Continuing on in verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And all God's people said, Amen. that's some good stuff, isn't it? But here's the thing. There's one key thing in there. When you look at those qualities, let's talk about those real quick. First of all, humility. Write down Philippians chapter 2. We're not going to turn there. If you want a perfect picture of humility that we see, then you can look at Jesus, how he is depicted in Philippians 2. It says that he made himself a slave, made himself nothing so that we could come to know him and his father because of his sacrifice. That's what he did for us. And so when we understand the humility that he had to make himself nothing on our behalf, then we can start to look at other people, those unbearable people, huh? those people. We can start to see them a little bit more differently when we understand what Jesus did for us. Gentleness was the second one. Gentleness. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't particularly, I'm, you know, this, man, this manly man thinking here, we, I don't really want people to look back at my life one day and go, you know, see me in the casket at my funeral and go, well, he was gentle. <laughs> but the thing is, when you look at that word and you start to think about how gentle God is with us, the word, if you look it up and study it out, it does mean a gentleness. It also means a self-control, a self-control. Because when God looked at us, he very rightfully so could have just poured his wrath out on us. Could he not? Amen. We deserve that. But yet God looks at us with control, holding himself and that wrath that we so deserve back so that he could, in humility, be gentle towards us. I'm so glad he did. The third one, this is the one I did not want to have to talk about this morning, but it is in the Bible, so I figure I better not skip it. It's patience. Patience. And I just have to ask today, now I'm the early one in my family. I like to be early. I don't like to be late. And there are times when uh, as lovely as my bride is where she may want to take a few extra moments to uh, work on her appearance or to gather our children and all that stuff. Now how many women, I just, I'm just curious, how many women wait on your men in here? Wow. Man. Okay. Wow. Well, you can identify with me too then. You can identify with me as well, because here's the, here's the thing. I sit in the car. Sometimes me and my son will sit in the car, and we're ready for mom. And, you know, Caleb's saying, mm, 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 let's go, let's go. Mm. And I'm saying, mm, 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 let's go. And I have my hands, or really one hand on the steering wheel with the other one on the horn just in case. You know what I'm holding back? Because the thing is, I know if I want unity, oneness, togetherness, I better not honk that horn. <laughs> And then I think about this. As you think about waiting in a car, I think about this. I think about how many times I've run, how many times my God could have honked the horn on me, hmm? and he didn't, and he was patient for me. And that leads us to the third thing, or the fourth thing, rather, that is listed there. Bearing with one another in love. In love. Putting up with those unbearable, unthinkable people that drive you nuts in life because you love them because you look at Jesus. They're not your focus anymore. Jesus is your focus to the point where you start to forget all the stuff that got on your nerves to begin with. And that's what faith can do in your life. And you may say, how can I display those qualities? How can I have that kind of a faith? Well, that's what verse 5 is all about. That common bond, that underlying factor, that foundation of this unity is in verse 5, and it's one faith. And so let's look today at three unifying faith facts. Three unifying faith facts. Facts about our faith that bring us together. And if you have your Bible still, then turn back with me to the book of Genesis. I want us to look at a character in the Bible that you may know well. He's known as Father Abraham. Uh, we're going to look at a time in his life when he was known as Abram in Genesis chapter 12. Look there with me, and I want us to look at a couple of verses about what faith can do. Point number one today is faith mobilizes disciples. 
Faith mobilizes disciples. That's the first of these unifying faith facts. And Abraham understood that. Because we're going to find in verse 1, he was called to move. Faith requires, faith that's real, faith that's in a real God requires some real movement. A lot of times we like to do this in our faith. We have faith squatters. And we'll sit, and we like to come sit and hear a sermon, and we need to because we're fed. But why are we fed? Why do we do church services? Why do we all come together as one like we are right now? I'll tell you, we come together as one so that we can be fed and energized to move and be mobilized to do something with the faith that God has given to us. Abraham understood that, understood that movement. He was called to leave everything that gave him stability in life. Let's look at a few things. I want to give you a few things about faith movement as we look at this when we talk about mobilizing disciples. In Genesis 12, in verse 1, the first thing is that faith movement takes you somewhere. I already said a lot of times we kind of get in that rut, don't we? And some of you, I don't want you to nod your heads, I don't want you to raise your hands because this is between you and God, but a lot of times, and you may be here today like this, where you feel like you've been in that faith rut for maybe years. You feel like you're stuck and you can't move. But God wants you to move, and he wants to give you the strength to do that. Let's look at Abraham in verse 1. We see the call, first of all, here in verse 1, and how we can realize that God wants us to go somewhere as well, just like Abraham. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country. Can you imagine this? Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you. In other words, Abraham, I'm not going to tell you many details yet, but I want you to leave everything you've ever known, all the stability you've built, everything you've worked for, and just trust me. Have faith in me and just go. Just go. I'd be, I might say, mm, let me think. No, no, I, I don't think I want to do that. T- give me some details first, right? I want to know the roadmap first. Well, God didn't give him that. He said go. And then what did Abraham do? And he says, if you do that, I'll bless you, verses 2 and 3. But verse 4, he said, it says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. 75-year-old Abram. God says, go. Abraham just says, okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to leave right now. So faith movement will take you somewhere. The second thing is faith movement will impact other people. When you start moving, it's going to impact other people. Look at verse 5 of Genesis 12. It says, then Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered. And get this part. And the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. What an awesome picture of what God will do when your faith starts to take you somewhere. You start to get mobilized as a disciple, a follower of Jesus that goes out and is willing to make other followers of Jesus. When he did that, not only his wife, his family went with him, but all the people they had acquired, you saw in verse 5, it impacted other people. And then in verse 8, my favorite part of all, it brings glory to God. That's the third thing faith movement will do. It will glorify God. In verse number 8, it says this, and he moved, everybody say that with me, and he moved. It's time for us to move maybe today. We've got some moving people here at Midway, and we're so blessed. But God never wants us to get satisfied, never wants us to get stuck in that rut, in that satisfaction mode of, well, God's done a lot. We can just celebrate it for a while. We always look back and celebrate the past, but we always do so with anticipation of what the future holds. Because God always has something more, and the same is true of your life. Verse 8, he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the east and Ai on the, uh, on the west, rather, and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And then in verse 9, I love this. This is maybe, maybe a fourth, and I'll give you a bonus one. Uh, so Abram journeyed, going still toward the south. He kept moving. He kept moving. He did not slow down, and the same should be said of us. Now, when you think about this balance beam of life, when you look at you know, what, what it looks like and how narrow life can, can be sometimes, you think about the gymnasts and all that they go through. You know, The thing about faith and this balance beam of life is it can always do one of two things. It can make us proactive and move, being mobilized, or it can kind of stifle us and paralyze us. And as we get on, it takes some faith just to get on this beam, and it gets kind of rocky, and I did spare you the spandex, just so you know, but we get on, and it's scary, and we shake, and we wobble, and we start taking some steps, and we have some faith, and then, you know, we go to church, and we hear this message that the preacher gives, and, you know, our knees shake for a lot of different reasons, and, you know, God's telling us he wants us to move, and we're willing to take some steps, and we walk on, sometimes slowly, some of us can move faster than others, but we walk on, and then we say, God, I know you've given me some steps to take. 
some faith steps that you want me to take. But, but God, if I'm going to move and I'm going to do something for you, I've got to be energized, so I've got to eat lunch. Now, I've got to eat lunch first, so I'm going I'm to go home and eat lunch, then I'm going to think about those steps that you wanted me to take, and then I'm going to think about it some more, and then I'm going to pray about it, and then I'm going to think about it some more, and then I'm going to think about it some more, and then I'm going to eat again. Uh, Because supper comes around, and before long, you kind of just start to settle a little bit. You know there's more steps to take, but then you start to realize that life happens, and you get busy. And you're up on this beam, but it gets kind of hard, and then you kind of get unstable. Your legs get tired, and they start to wobble, and you start to shake. And so you just kind of start to bend down slowly and say, "Uh, you know, God, I I, I know you probably want me to move, but, you know, I I don't want to fall, so I'm just going to kind of just sit down and... That's so much better. God, I, I, I know you have some steps that you want me to take, but, you know, the thing is about me, God, right now, I, I really don't want to fall because, you know, I wouldn't want to, you know, for, to make you look bad, God, like we have that much uh, authority in life, right? And so I'm just going to sit, and I, I don't want to do anything crazy, so I'm just going to kind of lay down and, you know, I'm just going to hold on. Let's get a good grip. Wrap my legs on there. And just so you know, a lot of us look like this in our faith. And then we keep praying and say, God, I know there were steps, but I don't want to fall. It's kind of dangerous. So, God, you know, on top of all this, I'm safe now, and I'm not going to fall. One of these days, I'd just like to, you know, fall asleep and, and, and just die in my sleep one day where it's just safe and I don't ever have to worry. And, you know, I can just hold on real tight and slowly step off. And then we want to get up and go. And we, we want to say, look what I did. I didn't fall off the beam. I made it. And then I think so many, and can you imagine, by the way, how many watch the Olympics? You watch the gymnasts, and they do all kind of crazy stuff. I did good just to stay on there, just so you know. But they got on there to do all this crazy stuff. What if they got on there, embraced the beam, and held on, and got off and said, "Woo! judge me. Do I get a 10? But here's the thing. I think God looks at us, and when we hold on to the beam, and we step off and say, I didn't fall. I think God looks at us, and some of you need to hear this so bad today because I do as well in my faith, that he looks at us and says, did you ever think about the fact that there's a mat down there? There's a mat that's underneath that beam, and that mat's me, and if you fall, it may hurt. Faith requires some movement, but if you fall, I'm going to be there to catch you. You're not saved, and you don't have faith Because you're really good at walking on the balance beam of life. You're saved and you have faith because I keep you and you're in the palm of my hand. And if you fall down, I'm going to catch you every step of the way. That's what faith movement will look like in your life. You don't have to hold on to that beam. And if you fall off, you can get right back up and keep moving. Some of you need to get right back up and keep moving today because you're laying on the mat. You just maybe didn't even realize that there's a mat there. His name's Jesus, if you know him today, and he will catch you every step of the way. David Platt said this about a safe life that God has not called us to. It requires movement, this faith does. It requires risk as well. He says in his book, Radical, To everyone wanting a safe, untroubled, comfortable life, free from danger, stay away from Jesus. Because he's called us to get on that balance beam and to move, and to slip, and to stumble, and to fall, but the whole way to be moving and mobilized as disciples that make disciples, going to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all the commands that he's given to us. And then he says, I'm going to be with you the whole way through. Acts 1.8, go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. For us, that means here, there, and everywhere. That's what we're called to do, and that's what being mobilized as a disciple truly looks like. So faith will mobilize us as disciples. Second thing, unifying fact about faith. Faith will minimize distractions. Faith minimizes distractions. Now, I don't know if you have one of these in your house. Hopefully you do for your air conditioner. These are kind of important. This is an air filter. How many of you have ever forgotten to change these before? How many of you found that it was fine and it didn't matter That's what I thought. Here's what happens. If you don't filter the air that circulates through your house, a few things are going to happen. You're going to breathe some other stuff. You're going to find that some things are going to get stopped up, perhaps. You're going to find that an air conditioner may not quite work. But faith is a lot like this. It's a filter for us because, I don't know if you've noticed, but life's busy. And life has a lot of distractions. Life has a lot of bad things that can distract us. Life has a lot of good things that can distract us as well. I know this from seminary, going to seminary and seeing all of the different facets of faith, all the different things you can study, all the different things that can take your attention. 
that are good things, biblical things. And I'll put it to you this way. It's about sometimes the hows or the wins of faith rather than the why of faith. God wants us to be so consumed by the why, that great commission, the great commandment that Jesus gave to us, that all those other things, good, bad, or in the middle, never become too much of a focus. They get filtered out. Even the good stuff gets filtered to the side at times so that you stay focused on what matters most in your life. Some of you, like me, get distracted many times in your life. And you need some faith filtering today. Because faith is a filter. Faith is something that filters out all those things in your life. Now, I know as I've studied things in the Bible, there's some things that can become pretty consuming. You know, when is Jesus going to come back? How is Jesus going to come back? How does the salvation process really look? What's every tiny little detail? You know, this whole thing of worship. How should we worship? What style does God like best? All these kind of unknowns and question marks. Those things, you know, the, the, we go to Bible studies. And Bible studies are great. Just so you know, God does like Bible studies. Just so you know. But the thing is, if a Bible study or if a study of a topic or something that is not pertaining to the mission that God has given us, that first and foremost call that he has for our life, even if it's good, if it minimizes the real mission, then faith needs to do some filtering. God loves when we dig deeper. God loves when we study the unknown so we can have more knowledge. But when the acquisition of knowledge takes precedence over what God has called us to do, your faith isn't taking you where God's leading you because he gave us a mission and we have a short amount of time to accomplish that mission. And so faith is a filter for us. And when faith starts filtering things in your life, and it's kind of like your computer screen of your life, Mac or PC, no matter which one you are, you have your main screen and it's what you're working on. It's the main documents that you're writing or whatever it might be that you're doing, spreadsheets or whatnot. And then at the bottom, there's these little spots, right? The things that you, and there's the little minimize button, it's the little subtract button. When you click it, it goes down at the bottom. It's not that it's not important, it's still there. You may still need to pull it up every now and then. But it's not on the main screen of your life. There are some good things that are consuming your life perhaps today. Stuff that you have been hiding behind because you know God has some faith steps on that balance beam of life that he wants you to take. But if you focus on these good areas, maybe, then I don't have to worry about those steps that he wants me to take, even though they're so practical and they're exactly what he need to do. Some of you have some bad areas you know don't fit the faith balance beam that God has you on in your life, and you need to refocus and allow faith to be your filter so that God can reveal to you and to me and to all of us, and this is how we become one, is that we're all focused in a direction that would be pleasing to God. Faith is a filter. Faith is also, when it comes with these distractions, faith is a funnel. Because what gets filtered, if you start filtering things down, and you start focusing your attention on certain things, then all of your action is going to follow that attention. You know what I mean? You're at work, right? And your yard is about this tall at home. Some of you are like, dang it, he had to bring that up. I got to do that too. When I get home, I got to do that this week. Your grass is this high, but you're at work and you can't do anything about that grass. Now, you could be consumed thinking about the grass being up to your knees at home, but probably if you still have a job, you put that in the minimize section. You minimize that because if you think about that grass so much that you don't do your job, it becomes a distraction and you may not have a job any longer. So sometimes you need to minimize some things and focus on what really matters in your life. And your, uh, your action, your effort, your energy gets funneled to areas where you start filtering down in your life. And that's what faith can provide. It gives us that road map because life's complicated. It's confusing. It throws us off balance so many times in our life. So faith will mobilize disciples. Faith maximizes. It minimizes distractions. But lastly, faith maximizes, makes it huge. Your determination. Now, I want you to think about this beam. If you watch the Olympics, and many of you said you watched the Olympics in the gymnastics, when you look at this beam, and you th- it's four inches wide, by the way. It's very, you saw my legs shaking. It was, it was hard to even keep balance just walking on it. These guys get up there, and they flip, guys and ladies, and they just go crazy on it. They flip off the end and land, and they do the, you know, a lot better looking thing than I did, and they celebrate what they've done, and they get all these great scores. That didn't happen because they decided a week or two before the Olympics, hey, I think I'll do some gymnastics. Amen. They have some major determination. And Abraham, when we look at what he was able to accomplish, had some major determination for us today, what we're truly determined to do. 
I want you to think about things you have really set out to do. Not those things that, like, you know, I, I determined to cut the grass this weekend, but I didn't quite get there because that happens too. But those things you really determined to do, you do. And in our faith, the same thing happens. We get determined. We think we're determined, but how determined are we? And then we just fall short. And it gets so frustrating when that happens. Amen? Amen. Or is it just me? That you just feel like you fall short with that faith, those steps that maybe God laid out. And you have that, you know, moment in church or during a Bible study and you know the steps God has for you. And you start to take them and then lunch comes and you eat and then you think some more. And you say, well, I want to talk to my spouse about it or my friends about, you know, what God's wanting me to do. And, but i got to wait till Thursday to do that because they're out of town. And, and then supper comes and you eat supper again. And we eat a lot, don't we? And we eat supper and then we go to bed and then Monday's here. And then life happens, and we just kind of end up squatting again, just sitting on our faith and not really moving, not really going anywhere. But God wants to tell you and I today through his word that he will maximize your determination because he'll do a couple of key things. And we saw this with Abraham, and we'll tie it to us. The first thing, this determination being maximized, what it will do is it will strengthen your potential. Amen. Faith strengthens potential. And I'm hearing some amens because you know what I'm talking about I know for me personally, when I was called into ministry, uh, right out of high school, I was 17 years old when I took my first position as a part-time bivocational youth pastor. Uh, and talk about some challenges. Talk about taking some steps of faith. And when that happened to me, I looked at God, and I've shared this story with you before perhaps, but I looked at God and said, God, you're nuts. <laughs> They were like, can he say that in church? I said it, and I'm still here, so he must have some major grace. I told God he was crazy because I was the introvert kid that sat in the back of the class. I, could, I would stay out if I had to to not do these presentations and that kind of thing. And God, you want me to talk in front of people? No, sir. No, sir. I didn't have the potential to do that. I'll tell you that flat out. I'm nothing grand today, but I'm able to make a difference for Jesus in the calling that he's given to me because he strengthened my potential, not because I'm very good. <laughs> and the same happens with you. It doesn't matter who you think you are. It doesn't matter how bad you think you are. It doesn't matter how horrible your past is. Jesus looks at you. Hear me today. Some of you have to know this because there's a barrier on that balance beam of life that's keeping you from moving forward. He looks at you, though, says, I know your past better than you. I know you better than you. I know everything about you, yet I love you. Amen. Yet I'm going to strengthen you to do things you never dreamed possible because you have faith in me and not in yourself. Now, that'll get you moving, won't it? That'll keep you focused. That'll filter some stuff out when you start looking at life that kind of a way. In Romans chapter 5, you don't have to turn there, but I want to read you a couple of very possibly familiar verses to you. Romans chapter 5, jot that down in verses 1 and 2. And it talks about faith and some of the potential strengthening things that it brings about, some of the power that comes from God, because God does strengthen our potential when we have faith through him. He says this, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, having been justified by faith... We have, and think about all these things we get, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. All those things rolled into those two verses. We have available to us if we know Jesus and have faith and faith in him alone. That's what will strengthen the potential that you think you don't have sometimes in your life. Abraham definitely understood what it meant to have his potential strengthened. In Genesis 12, do you think he wanted to leave all that he knew? Do you think he wanted to leave all those things that made him comfortable? Do you think he wanted to leave his home and go to a place that God was eventually in his own timing going to tell him? Absolutely not. And in Genesis 22, something else happened uh, with Abraham. He had one son, Isaac. And if you remember in, verse, uh, in the second and third verses of Genesis 12, a promise was made to Abraham. He was promised that he would make his name great, that many nations would come from his name. And when he did that, he had a son. He had one son. This is the only way that could happen, right? Because you've got to have a son for a name to get passed on. Well, God says, I want you to sacrifice your only son. In Genesis chapter 22, one of my favorite passages in the Bible because hundred, all these years before Jesus was to come on the scene, we see a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ in Genesis chapter 22. We won't go through all that because I won't, I won't keep you until after lunch today, but I challenge you to look through that. But here's what you'll find. The second thing when it comes to maximizing our determination, not just will our potential be strengthened, but our pride will get sacrificed. Mm. 
Abraham understood that. He never thought he would have been able to leave his hometown, much less look at his only son that he loved. And it says that, I think it's verse 3, that he loved his son. And he was the promise of God of how all that was going to happen. But he was willing to sacrifice him. And Hebrews 11 says that he even believed that God would raise him from the dead if need be. God wants to sacrifice some pride in us too so that our potential can be strengthened and our determination gets maximized and we take those steps of faith. Flip with me to Hebrews chapter 10, if you will. And I want to give you a few key applications before we wrap things up today. Hebrews chapter 10. Now, Hebrews 11 is known as the Hall of Fame of Faith. It talks about people like Abraham and how they were willing to do all these amazing things for God and how their faith was so secure and so sound. And it's got some challenges for us in Hebrews chapter 10. Now, let's, let's look at uh, verse 32, verse 32 of Hebrews chapter 10. And I want to give you four key applications today. We've talked about a lot of stuff, talked about a lot of things about our faith, that it mobilizes disciples, that it minimizes distractions, filters stuff out in your life, funnels your attention, all of your effort, and then it maximizes your potential. Your pride gets sacrificed. You're strengthened in your potential and the abilities that God even gives you. He'll change you to mold you into what he needs to make you. But four applications of all that. First of all, remember, remember when you first came to know this, Jesus. Remember that. Savor that moment. Hold on to that moment where you came to know this one fate that we're talking about. Verse 32, that's the first thing application-wise today. It says, but recall the former days in which after you were illuminated. That means the light switch came on. You understood this faith. You understood this thing about Jesus. And you remember this moment. Hold on to that moment when you gave your life to him. Remember, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle. Can I hear an amen? amen? A lot of times we think this journey of faith God's called us to is a big, wide balance beam that's about eight feet wide so we can just sprawl out and lay down and rest and have life easy. But in fact, we find out it's a four-inch wide balance beam Then times we're going to fall off and it's going to hurt. And you look at God sometimes and go, I thought this was going to be easy. I just landed on my head and it hurt. But God looks at you and says, I want you to remember when you came to know me. And then I want you to think about how you have endured. And then he continues, verse 33. Partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations. And partly when you became companions. Here's this concept of one showing back up. When you became companions of those who were so treated. That's why we're here today. Amen. We all go through struggles. You and I, all of us alike. But God has this common bond of faith that he wants to bring about in our lives where we stick together, bear each other's burdens, and go through it together. Amen? Amen. And so that's the first thing. Remember that. And some of you may not be able to recall that time. You would like to. You're going to have an opportunity, not because I'm giving it to you, but because God always makes it available to you, to make that decision today where you can look at today and say, God, I gave my life to you. I can remember that day today, and I'm going to mark it down. You'll be able to do that in just a moment. And I'm going to give you an opportunity. Let's continue on. Verse 35 is the second application. Is realize that you serve the same God as you did back then. And realize that you still have that same confidence. Verse 35 says, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. How many times do you feel like you're lacking that confidence and ability to keep moving? You get on that balance beam and your legs start to kind of shake and wobble. And you start to bend down and you're thinking about sitting down and just holding on to that balance beam because it's narrow and it hurts and you don't want to fall. But then you realize you have some confidence because Jesus gives it all to you and it's about what he can do, not about how good you are. And that's what this verse is talking about. Realize you still have that same confidence. The third thing, hold on to the unifying factors of your faith. Hold on to the unifying factors of your faith. Let's look at verse number 36. It says, for you have need of endurance. Amen? Amen. <laughs> We have need of endurance to keep going, that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now, our pastor led us through a study of the five key doctrines of our faith, of Christianity. Now, those are the things that unifies us. There's a lot of other good stuff that's biblical and very important for us to study, but they're not those common threads that make Christianity that Jesus instituted, the one he started, not the ones that we sometimes dream up in our mind. He started it based on some very key things. I want to give them to you quickly. We talked about them in this series. The first one is the virgin birth of Christ. It shows the deity that he's fully God and fully man. The virgin birth of Christ. 
the verbal plenary inspiration of the Bible. Verbal inspiration of the Bible means that God's word, though written by human hands, was directly God-breathed and given to us as his word to us. So what we read in there is all authoritative, and it's exactly what we need to follow in our life. So the virgin birth, the verbal inspiration of the Bible, the vicarious suffering of Jesus. Vicarious means that we swap places. God took our place when he died on the cross for us so that we could have a relationship with our Father through Jesus Christ. He took our place, paid a penalty for our sins we could never pay. The victorious resurrection. Not only did Jesus die, he also rose again and he's alive today. For you and for me, that means we don't have to walk around like this. Even when life hurts, we can have our heads held high with confidence, walk around as a living, alive, joyful Christian who has this joy that comes from within that nobody understands because it's not human, it's straight from Jesus because he is alive, we're made alive as well. The victorious resurrection. Lastly, and we saw this in that verse we just read in Hebrews 10, verse 37, the visible return of Jesus. He's coming back. He is coming back. And that's why we should be so focused, be mobilized, minimize those distractions, and be determined to the max to make a difference for him. Because he's coming back to get us, church, and we'll be one forever and forever. So hold on to those unifying factors. Last thing, last application is let go of the beam. Let go of the beam and don't hold back. Don't hold back. Circle those three words if you're taking notes because they come straight from verses 38 and 39. It says this in Hebrews 10, 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back. Let's say that together. I think that's an anthem of our church and should be a part of who we are. Let's say that together. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Let go of the beam today. Trust in God with all your heart. If you already know him, take those faith steps because it's going to unify the church. What if we all did that? What could the church look like? How unified could the church be? We'd be unified in our action. First of all, that we're mobilized as disciples. We'd be unified in our attention, what we're focused on. Distractions are minimized. And we'd be unified in our attitudes, knowing that we have confidence and our determination can keep moving, even when the balance beam of life kind of gets narrow. And it's hard to keep the balance. Will you bow your heads with me and close your eyes today? For some of you, this concept of faith is very foreign. It's a very foreign concept because you don't really know right now that you today, if you were to die, you would spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. You'd like to know this faith, but you're just not sure that you've got it nailed down. The Bible makes it very clear that if you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone, meaning that you look at him, it's not about a prayer, by the way. I don't have to lead you in that prayer. That's something that you do. It's between you and God. It's your heart being turned to him. It's where you look to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you today because I fall off the beam. I blow it in my life. I sin, and I know I'm separated from you. Jesus, I believe you died for me. I believe in those five things we talked about. I believe you died paying a price for me I could never pay so that I, like you, could be made alive. You rose again, and I can be alive with you forever. Jesus, right now, I give you me, all of me, not some, all of me. And I'm still going to slip, and I'm still going to stumble, and I'm still going to fall, but I give you all of me. Some of you need to take that step right now, most important faith step you could ever take. I want to give you just a moment to do that right now. So if you have never made that decision, do so right now in the silence of this moment with your own words turning your heart to God. Would you do that right now? Some of you are here and you've made that decision with all heads bowed and all eyes closed today. I want to say a prayer for you. Nobody's going to come to you, embarrass you, grab you by the arm. We just want to pray for you. I want to challenge you to take some steps to let some people know later on. But for right now, I want to pray for you. If you made that decision today, nobody looking around, just between you and the Lord, you need to acknowledge that. Will you just slip your hand up say, pray for me. I prayed to receive Jesus. I didn't know where I was going. I see your hands all across the building. Keep them up. I see two, three. Awesome. Anybody? Anybody else? Thank you. Let me pray for you guys. God, thank you so very much for those that have made this all-important decision of faith to put their faith and their hope in you. 
God, they have let go of the beam of their own life to follow this faith walk that you have for us, God. And we don't know what lies ahead, and there will be slips and falls. But, God, for these that have made that decision, may they always rely on you. Recalling this day, as it said in verse 32 of Hebrews 10, recalling today as the day they got it nailed down. God, we thank you for them, and we praise you that you're still in the saving business of saving our souls that are so undeserving. And that's why we can be one today. Some of you are here, nobody looking around for a moment, you know Jesus. But God has laid today a very specific faith step, or two, or three, or four, on your heart and on your mind today. And you know you need to follow that. You've got something specifically on your mind. If so, I want to ask you just to slip your hand up. I want to pray for you as well. God's given me some steps. I see hands. Keep them up. Keep them up high all across the building. Thank you. You can put your hands down. God, I just praise you for those that raised their hand. For either of these reasons, may we come together and may we take steps to follow after you no matter the cost. God, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for what's going to come in the days ahead because of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray all this in his blessed and holy name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Let's welcome those to the family of God that have prayed to receive Christ. And if you did pray to receive Christ today, I want to challenge you to do uh, just one simple thing as a next step. I want you to think about what God's done in your life. Recall it, mark it down, write it in your Bibles, mark this date down. But I want you to fill out a card because we want to hear from you. We want to help you move forward. We've got a booklet, and it looks like this. It's called Beginning Steps for New Believers. I want to get one of these in your hands today before you leave. It gives you some steps of what's next because discipleship is a process that keeps going. It's not just a one-time decision. It keeps moving. And so there's a card in the seat back in front of you. Some of you are here, and you've already made that decision, but you need to take that step of baptism uh, of giving your life to Christ and following that in that step that shows the world what's already happened. It's a symbol of that death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, and you need to take that step. Maybe you want to join Midway, find a life group, or some other decision that God's laid on your heart. You need prayer. Fill out that card, and I'm going to be standing up front here at the end of the service. And you can bring that card to me personally or to one of our ushers at the doors or to the information desk. But I challenge you, please do that so that we can be one and follow this process of discipleship that we've been talking about thus far. Thank you so much for being here. I'm asking